Uh, so uh, for me, this is a, 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 an absolutely wonderful uh, visit to Poland. I'm uh, enjoying the 25th anniversary of your democracy, uh, and uh, I'm very moved by it. I have seen a lot of uh, places in the world, uh, and I've worked in a lot of places in the world, and I regard what Poland has accomplished to be one of the most, most successful uh, and most inspiring um, national efforts that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And so for me, it's a very happy occasion to be here. I uh, came to Poland uh, first uh, 25 uh, years ago and two months. Uh, in fact, I came on the day that the roundtable agreement was signed. Uh, and um, I came on that day because uh, I didn't want to come before it was signed. And when I was asked uh, by the uh, government in 1989, early in 1989, to come to Poland to discuss the foreign foreign debt crisis that Poland was facing. I said, uh, when Lech Wałęsa is uh, freed from house arrest, I'll come to Poland. And um, it was very wonderful to arrive the day that the roundtable agreement was signed. And at that moment, uh, I began, began, began to work with the Solidarity Economic Advisors I don't know if people know the name of uh, Professor Trechakovsky. D does that name ring a bell for people? Does everybody know who that is? No, he, w he was a real gentleman, a uh, professor who was a senior advisor to uh, the uh, Solidarity Movement. And uh, he was a very worried man in the spring of 1989, worried about uh, Poland feeding itself, worried about hunger. Uh, in the cities, worried about the uh, collapse of the economy. And so he asked me uh, for help, and I began coming here in, in the spring. And uh, just after the elections uh, on June 4th, I came back, and uh, where is uh, Gregor Schlindenberg? He's there. Uh, my uh, dear friend, uh, uh, Larry Lindenberg, who was the business manager of Gazeta Viborcha, the first business manager who made the newspaper come out of nowhere and uh, spent his days uh, scurrying uh, around Poland to find newsprint in a desperate uh, situation so that your first free newspaper could, uh, could be printed, um, kindly introduced me to Jacek Koran uh, and uh, also to uh, uh, Bronislav Goremek uh, and uh, to Adam Miknik uh, and to Lech Wałęsa. So we discussed the economic uh, conditions uh, with, with all of them in uh, June and July of uh, 1989. And I'll just tell you briefly the quick story of uh, meeting Jacek Koran the first time. Uh, he was already a hero of mine. Uh, because he was a famed freedom fighter and a famed uh, trade unionist and a great man and a very brave man and a very uh, inspirational man. So I was very excited to, uh, to meet him. And uh, Gregor took me and a colleague over to uh, Mr. Koran's flat uh, in uh, the middle of the city. And it was a room filled with books, very crowded, uh, and uh, Quran was at his desk and uh, with a bottle of whiskey and cigarettes. Uh, and he was smoking already uh, up a storm, so you could barely breathe in the room, uh, truly. Uh, and uh, he said, OK, so what do you want? <laughs> uh, and uh, was uh, smoking uh, like crazy, and I began to described to him this puzzle of Poland facing an economic collapse, which was extraordinary, um, and a financial destabilization, which was one of the worst in modern history, 
bankruptcy, hyperinflation uh, on its way, and um, hard to imagine as I was walking on the street here in this beautiful alley, you would, you don't remember the young people, but uh, you would see people crying on Novi Sviat, uh, mothers crying because they could find no milk for their kids, for example. It was completely dramatic day to day uh, in that spring. And so it was very complicated. No one, no government, no movement had ever faced a crisis like this. Um, and uh, everybody was trying to figure out what to do. And I started to describe my thoughts about this based on my own experiences and similar events in history uh, uh, because there were some analogies, at least. Uh, one was actually post-World War II Germany in 1947, which was also a, a chaotic situation of mass shortages and the money didn't work. And uh, so there were some lessons and I began to describe it and, uh, and every two minutes or so he'd say, Tak, tak, uh, and I'd tell me more, tak, rosamin, rosamin. And he just started uh, this, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so the, we went on for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half. I'm not exaggerating, Larry. We talked and talked and talked and suddenly it was about 11 at night or 11.30 at night and every five minutes, tak, rosamin, tak, rosamin. And uh, this went on until finally, somehow around midnight, it stopped and he said, okay, I want a memo now. How to make a market economy. And all I want is we must return to Europe. How do we do it? So write this down now. And I, I said, okay, uh, Mr. Koran, we'll do that. Um, I'm leaving. Uh, the day after tomorrow and we'll write something and we'll send it to you. There's a new fax machine. Fax machines were new in Poland. Uh, but there was a new fax machine and we'll send it to you. He said, no, I need it tomorrow morning. I said, excuse me? He said, I need it tomorrow morning. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, um, hmm, what are we going to do? And since Larry Lindenberg was our host. Um, Larry said, why don't we go to Gazeta Viborcha and we can work on it there. Gazeta Viborcha, if I remember correctly, was in a kindergarten room, uh, not the beautiful office I saw uh, this morning, but in a kindergarten. And uh, we went locked at night. Thankfully, I had the business manager of Gazeta Viborcha as my host and guide. And uh, we went in the middle of the night and um, turned on the lights and there was planks of wood across the sink of a kindergarten room and there was the IBM computer first generation on the, uh, on the, uh, um, on the sink. And we pulled up a chair and um, I sat for six hours and typed this memo, which I don't know if uh, you distributed, but that's where that memo came from. It's uh, something I'm extremely proud of and uh, moved by, actually. It was the first time anybody had actually written down a, um, a kind of uh, financial and uh, uh, just even basic uh, strategy of what to do in that uh, very deep crisis. And a lot of ideas uh, came that night which ended up being implemented in Poland. But the next morning we gave it to, uh, we went back to uh, Koran and he took it. Uh, and um, uh, that's how this uh, came, came to be. Uh, and uh, from there he directed us uh, all around to meet with uh, Adam McNick uh, next. Uh, and then to fly to Gdansk to, uh, to discuss this with, uh, with Mr. Valenza, uh, which we did. Uh, the flight to Gdansk uh, in those days to show you how mixed up the economy was cost us $3 round trip from uh, Warsaw at the black market exchange rate. 
Uh, this was a completely weird, distorted, broken uh, kaleidoscope, uh, uh, not an economy. It was uh, just a falling shambles uh, in uh, 1989. And um, I'll just uh, stop by saying that uh, in the weeks that followed, wonderful things happened in this country. I think some of them have probably not been properly written in history yet, uh, but uh, Mikhail Gorbachev played a huge role for Poland's uh, future by encouraging uh, Jaruzelski to bring solidarity into the government. Uh, Russia, therefore, Soviet Union played a very constructive role, very unusual in Poland's history. Uh, but a peaceful transition was made, and um, miracles happened. Mr. Mazowiecki became prime minister. I met him the first night of his prime ministership and discussed with him the economic situation. And uh, he said something to me that was very important and I think uh, very realistic. Uh, he said that he was uh, looking for his Ludwig Erhard which uh, for me was a very meaningful statement. Ludwig Erhard was the architect of the German economic miracle and the one who helped Germany out of the chaos of uh, 1947 and the immediate post-war of uh, Germany. And he found uh, his Ludwig Erhard in uh, Leszek Balcerowicz, who uh, did a, a great historic job for this country. Uh, at a time of extraordinary crisis, uh, Balcerowicz is a man of uh, great uh, brilliance uh, and great uh, boldness and great honesty. And uh, that's not an easy combination, by the way. Uh, this region was filled with dishonest people. Poland uh, uniquely uh, had a, a huge preponderance of very honest people in government. That's one of the reasons why Poland did so well. Uh, in this uh, deep crisis period. In many other places, crooks dominated uh, the scene, but in Poland, uh, very intelligent, very brave, very hardworking people dominated the scene. And the economic reforms uh, got started with uh, a great deal of, um, of uh, sense of profound crisis and sense of despair. And I think it's hard probably for many of you to um, sense how much despair there was in this country uh, in uh, 1989 and 1990. Uh, I was told repeatedly that this was a hopeless country, uh, that there was no future, no hope, that Poles would never cooperate, that Poles would never accomplish anything. And by the way, I went to Germany and I was told that by senior German officials. The attitudes about Poland were very negative uh, and uh, the reputation of Poland was very negative. All of it I found to be profoundly unfair, of course, and I spent a year arguing uh, on behalf of this country in every place that I could uh, and uh, helped. I learned somewhere that you were using historical arguments in Germany. Of course. You use every argument. Uh, but uh, I said that Poland needed its uh, debts canceled, and that was I was the only person uh, who said that for quite a while. And uh, that was a, a lone voice. And of course, it happened in the end, uh, about $16 billion canceled of Poland's debts. And one of the ways that it happened in the end was uh, that I went to the Library of Congress and printed out the cancellation of Germany's debts uh, in 1953 uh, in an agreement between Germany and creditor governments. And we went to Chancellor Kohl and said if Germany, which had almost destroyed the world, could get its debts canceled in a fresh start, then surely Poland could uh, get its uh, debts canceled and get a fresh start. And Kohl actually paused and said, you know, that's a good argument. Uh, and uh, this was part of the turning point. Germany supported it. President Bush supported it. And uh, in the end, it happened. And so uh, history can play a role. So that's uh, my uh, 
memory of Yatsu Koran. Uh, and um, uh, I think uh, while I didn't know him well, I knew him at this intense moment, uh, and I could uh, see the charisma. And then after the program started, I knew him as labor minister, of course, and, and discussed with him many times uh, the challenges of uh, the early days of Poland's reforms. So he was a really very, very great man, and uh, I think your generation uh, can look to him as, as one of the great founding fathers of modern Poland. No, we, no, no, we should, uh, yeah, why, why don't we talk and I'll show, uh, show things as, as we go. Well, my questions will be pretty short, so I'm not sure if uh, we should switch to yep. polski język. <laughs> Ale w takim razie chciałbym dopytać do... Can people understand yeah. 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 Chciałbym dopytać się właściwie w dwóch sprawach, jeśli chodzi o, 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 o tę um, opowieść. Czy jest tak, że przed tym memo napisanym z Dawidem Liptonem nie powstał wcześniej jakiś nie tyle plan, co sugestie gospodarcze jeszcze dla rządu Mieczysława Rakowskiego, które miały znacznie bardziej taki gradualistyczny charakter, um, gdzie na przykład, jeśli się nie mylę, proponowano nie uwolnienie całkowite cen, co zresztą później komunistyczny rząd Mieczysława Rakowskiego zrobił, tylko stopniowe podwyższanie regulowanych cen. Wszystko jedno. W każdym razie, o ile tutaj używane jest chyba takie pojęcie w tym planie, wydaje mi się, no właśnie, że mamy do czynienia z shock approach, albo z dramatic marketization, czyli z takimi ostrymi działaniami, to w, to w pierwotny plan jakoś tam dyskutowany jeszcze z wcześniejszą władzą zakładał in, trochę inne podejście. To jest prawda? Tak było? I didn't have too much to do with the previous government. I came April 4th and 5th, uh, 1989, at the time of the roundtable signing. And I had uh, uh, meetings with the government uh, once and then with the Foreign Trade Ministry about the foreign debt, and then in uh, May about uh, the general macroeconomic situation. So I wasn't really too familiar in detail with the, the plans, but what I could see as a uh, specialist in uh, finance was that Poland was uh, slipping into a, a kind of uh, financial chaos. Uh, and this had many aspects to it, uh, but basically uh, you could see the black market prices rising at an alarming rate across all the food, goods, and many other uh, parts of the economy. And if you went on uh, Novi Sviat or any other part of the city, you couldn't find goods in the shops. Uh, the products were gone. Uh, maybe there was uh, bread uh, and there was black market trade, but the, there was a collapse of uh, any kind of normal, uh, even daily life. And that's why there was fear of uh, food shortages and... and uh, even uh, the, many of the economic advisors in solidarity were saying that there would be famine by the fall or early in 1990. So the problem was that the financial crisis was very acute, very deep. Uh, in fact, when I went to see uh, Lech Wałęsa, the first sentence I uh, said to him was that Poland is falling into a hyperinflation. Um, and uh, he said to me that he didn't uh, want an academic discussion. And I said, I can assure you, Mr. Valenza, there's nothing academic about uh, hyperinflation. Uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, catastrophic and everything needs to be done to prevent uh, hyperinflation. Um, and that's true, by the way. Uh, hyperinflations are catastrophic. Um, and Poland had a uh, 
very odd kind of hyperinflation because it had fixed prices also of an artificial economy. So uh, you probably remember Mr. Kowotko, or he may be still a major figure here, uh, but he coined a phrase called hyper... Major for himself, definitely. Yeah, he, he coined a phrase called hyper shortageflation, uh, which was his description of... Uh, hyperinflation and black markets and shortages uh, in, uh, in the shops, but it was a very, very dramatic thing. So I never really spent too much time with the, the Rakowski government, but I did have ideas about uh, how to stabilize the economy, and I was quite sure that only solidarity would be able to do it. Um, this was one of my major arguments that after the June 4th election, I believed that solidarity should try to form the government and that, that it was necessary, in fact, for Poland's future. And that in itself was not an accepted idea by any means. The first idea of solidarity leaders actually was not to form the government, but to try to monitor the communist regime through a Senate economic committee of the OKP members, and I argued that I didn't think that that was going to work, that the crisis was so deep and the mandate of solidarity was so strong that actually solidarity really had to take the government. But it's hard to understand, you know, now, in, in retrospect, nobody knew what was possible. My wife is from Prague. The last time uh, anyone before 1989 tried to form the government, uh, Soviet tanks came in. Uh, and the only other time I had been in Poland uh, before that was 1976 in the chaos and, and uh, then the long martial law period. So nobody knew what was possible. But I knew as a macroeconomist and one who had been experienced in extreme crises in Latin America that what Poland was experiencing was very, very dangerous and very acute. There's no way the Rakowski government could have handled it. And in fact, there's no way that Poland could have handled it either, except by a combination of internal measures and external help. This is one of the most difficult and complicated and important lessons of all economic crises, which is they don't get solved only by a country themselves, they only get solved in an international context. And that was as true of Poland as it was of many, many other very deep economic crises. O tym się często zapomina, a jakoś nie, nie zafunkcjonowało to w każdym razie w, w świadomości zbiorowej w Polsce i też tego się nie pamięta. Te, tak mi się wydaje, ale to według wszelkich przekazów, także samych wspomnień Jacka Kuronia, to Jacek Kuroń był e, właściwie najradykalniejszym zwolennikiem skokowej, skokowego urynkowienia e, polskiej gospodarki. E, e, czy, czy, czy rzeczywiście tak było, że on odegrał kluczową rolę e, w tym, żeby przekonać do tego zespół ekspercki, który był bardzo podzielony w tym e, także e, e, w, w tym nie, nie, powiedzmy to nie w, 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 ra, generalnie raczej skła, skłaniający się do tego, żeby przyjąć jakiś rodzaj trzeciej drogi. E, czy, 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 czy pan to jakoś śledził, obserwował? Czy tak samo pan ocenia tę sytuację? I think one of the uh, most complicated things for people to understand about uh, this whole discussion and crisis is the difference of addressing a, is three things. The difference of addressing a financial crisis, second, making a market economy, and third, deciding what kind of market economy one wants. These are three completely different things, but they're all confused in the discussion about these issues, very deeply confused. Poland wasn't just undertaking reforms at its leisure. 
Poland was a country in a hurricane. It was a revolution. It was a collapse. It was a once in a three generation crisis. It was a need for fundamental societal change, thank God, made possible by the collapse of the Soviet empire. So that's one part, extreme crisis, financial crisis. A second part was asking a basic question about what kind of economy. There were high theoretical arguments, I know, but I didn't get involved in too many of them. There was a group that said Poland should now make socialism work because socialism could be made to work and now there could be a worker economy. So I don't know how big that variant was, but there was a variant that said we've had the Soviet Union on our back for 45 years and now it's off our back, now we can have true socialism. There was a different view, which Mr. Koran definitely uh, exemplified, and Adam Miknik and uh, Bronislav Goremek uh, and Lech Wałęsa, which was Poland should now have a normal economy. And normal means part of Europe. The deepest motivation, in my opinion, for the revolution was that the Iron Curtain had fallen or was falling. Nobody knew, but it seemed to be falling. And now was a chance for Poland to become a normal part of a normal Europe again. That was my sense and that was my hope personally and my belief as well. So I hoped that Poland would be a normal economy. My own view was don't experiment to make socialism work, make a market economy. What kind of market economy is a third question. I had a basic answer, make a European market economy. There's lots of slogans in economic discussion. They're generally very uh, meaningless, by the way. Uh, I don't like these slogans. Uh, I think that they are excuses for thinking and they're excuses for deep knowledge. Neoliberalism is a term very much discussed. I think it's mostly a silly term, by the way. Poland wasn't going to be a free market economy. Poland was going to be a European economy. There is no European economy, anything like a free market economy. If you look at, for instance, a simple measure, the share of national income that is taxed and that is spent by government, in a free market economy, that's near zero. But in Poland, that was always above 40% of national income. And it's been always above 40% of national income. That is what we call a mixed economy. I had no doubt that Poland would have a mixed economy. My own argument was don't go for socialism, go for a mixed economy. A market economy, I would say a capitalist economy, that means private ownership of most of the enterprises in the society. A corporate economy because that's the organizational form of uh, Western Europe, the United States, all high income countries. Now basically almost all countries in the world but it wasn't as true then in 1989. But I felt that Poland was part of Europe and that the whole idea was freedom, democracy, return to Europe, and a normal economy. And that's what Koran was, was after. And he asked me, how do you make Poland part of Europe? And then there's a third discussion, which I know is a very extant discussion because it's part of any society. How do you balance different issues of more government spending, less government spending, bigger role, smaller role? Those are the debates of politics. 
and they are Poland's debates, they're America's debates, they're debates of every society. They're generally the debates between the center left and the center right in most high income countries. A little bit more government, a little bit less government, more regulation, less regulation, uh, more care for the environment, more transfers to the poor, and so on. My own personal politics is center left politics. I'm my favorite economies are the Scandinavian economies, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. But what I said in 1989, and this was not very well understood, I must say, until today, I've said it maybe a thousand times, but I'll say it a thousand and one times. I said no matter whether Poland wanted to be like Sweden or wanted to be like Britain or wanted to be like the United States, the things to do at the beginning were the same. Didn't make too much difference because all of those countries have a currency that works. They have prices that reflect supply and demand. They have international trade. And so those issues are not the big issues of debate. And Poland never went through a phase, thank goodness, by the way, in my opinion, of privatizing the healthcare system or privatizing the education system or something like that. I think it would be a big mistake, in my own opinion. Uh, I know some people may believe that. I don't believe that, and I don't think that it's very likely in Europe to see that kind of uh, economic system. So when you ask me uh, what did Jacek Koran believe, Jacek Koran believed that Poland should be a European country in normal part of Europe. When you ask me what did he believe about the exchange rate, I don't think he had any particular views about the exchange rate. When you ask me what did he believe about the pace of, uh, of uh, unification of the exchange rate, that's what he asked me as a financial expert. He didn't have any opinions. Uh, so I told him what I thought. And I gave an idea which was an unusual idea and which was a very good idea, uh, which was that Poland could have a convertible currency right away. That was one of the main arguments that I made, which was a correct argument uh, in retrospect and I think a good argument in prospect, but it was a very unusual argument. Many people said spend five or ten years to decontrol prices and so forth. I said two things. First, you don't know what you're talking about because you have no idea what a hyperinflation is uh, and you are going to have to stabilize this economy. Second, uh, you're not going to be able to reorganize a completely broken economy with fixed prices. And third, international trade is going to be Poland's lifeblood. It's going to be the way Poland begins its economic recovery. It's going to be a key organizing principle for attracting foreign investment. And so for all of that, one needs a convertible currency. Now, in 1989, the Zwoti was not exactly an impressive currency. It was a collapsed currency, as I already explained to you, was so chaotic that you could buy a plane ticket round trip Gdansk, Warsaw, for three bucks because the prices and the black market were completely in, uh, in a chaotic situation. I knew frankly, that this was not a way that you're going to sort that out uh, gradually and that it didn't even make sense to think in those terms. And so I said that Poland could have a convertible Zwoti right away. They said, that's crazy, Professor Sachs. How could the currency be convertible? I said, it already is convertible. What do you mean? I said, well, I was just in a taxi cab and I converted dollars to uh, Zwoti. Uh, of course, I did it at the rate of 7,500 zloty to the dollar uh, in, the, in the black market, and the official rate was one-fifth of that. I said if you unify the official rate and the black market rate, it's a convertible currency, uh, and you already have a currency that can work. And um, they scratched their head and said, something's wrong with that. It's supposed to take 10 years to do this. I said, no, it doesn't have to take 10 years. It can be done right away. And there's a very long story, which I won't bore you with unless you want to be bored with it, um, about how Poland came to have not only a stable currency, a, a convertible currency, but a stable currency. That was one of the big successes of 1990. 
And for that, one of the things I invented was the Zwoti Stabilization Fund. Uh, and not only invented it, but raised a billion dollars for it. And not only raised a billion dollars for it, raised a billion dollars for it in one day, actually, uh, in the White House uh, in September 1989. It's a fascinating story, uh, which I won't tell you unless you ask. Uh, but uh, when I tried to raise uh, similar money for Russia two years later, I was completely shut out not because of the economics, but because of the politics. Everybody wanted Poland to succeed, which was wonderful. Nobody wanted Russia to succeed, by the way. Uh, nobody in the West wanted Russia to succeed. So it's a big difference. This is a big mistake in economics to choose. You're our friend. You're our enemy. We help you. We don't help you. This is one of the things that makes the world such a dangerous place. It comes back to haunt you 20 years later. Uh, and um, this is one of the mistakes that the United States made vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Russia in 1991. But in any event, to come back to your question, Kuran was, I, I don't believe he was an expert in monetary or financial economics. Uh, what he was an expert in was humanity and Poland. And he wanted Poland to be normal and he wanted Poland to return to Europe, and he wanted Poland to find friends and support internationally. And that's what he asked me to help with at a technical level. How could that be done? And that's what I tried to do, and actually did do. Ja oczywiście nie podejrzewałem Jacka Kronia aż taką rozległą wiedzę, ale ale, ale z pewnością wizja e, e, z 89 roku albo, albo sposób myślenia Kuronia był taki, jak rozumiem go później rekonstruował, tym, przy czym krytycznie po latach. To znaczy, że najpierw trzeba w Polsce zbudować kapitalizm, żeby Kuroń mógł później zbudować socjaldemokrację. E, Kuroń się do tego odniósł krytycznie po latach, dlatego że argumentując, że to jest... E, myślenie o gospodarce za ludzi, a nie z ludźmi. Tak jakby trochę chciał jednak wrócić do idei samorządności pracowników, czy do idei prywatyzacji z udziałem pracowników, w każdym razie większego udziału czynnika społecznego. Jak pamiętamy, plan Balcerowicza był wprowadzony błyskawicznie, właściwie nawet nie było czasu na debatę publiczną. Ja nie zamierzam tutaj w żadnym wypadku, chciałem to bardzo podkreślić, panie profesorze, prowadzić rozliczeń historycznych, bo jestem na to za młody, po prostu miałem wtedy 9 lat i nie stawałem przed takimi wyborami, więc mam w sobie bardzo dużo pokory w związku z tym. Natomiast ch ch chciałbym się dowiedzieć, co się nie udało, skoro e, Jacek Kuroń e, tak bardzo się rozczarował e, dekadę później właściwie do tego stopnia, że, że e, gotów był nazwać ten kraj krajem neoliberalnym albo krajem, który zbudował, nawet on tak być może w jakiejś takiej przesadzie publicystycznej e, napisał, że zbudowaliśmy na, z Polski Republikę Złodziejską. E, raczej chcę oddać skalę jego rozczarowania niż, e, niż jakiś opis faktyczny. Tym niemniej coś musiało pójść nie tak, e, skoro nie tylko Kuroń, ale bardzo wielu ludzi jednak było rozczarowanych, a terapia szokowa stała się tematem bardzo kontrowersyjnym w Polsce i jest nim do dziś. Mógłby pan powiedzieć, co pana zdaniem udało się nie tak, albo nie udało się w polskiej transformacji? Poland uh, became a normal country with uh, normal politics and normal disappointments and normal divisions. Uh, and uh, you have no right to anything more than that. Uh, you have no right to utopia, uh, and you have no right to be beyond the same kinds of debates that every place has. Uh, so I'm not surprised. Uh, nothing went wrong. It's just that Poland now is like Europe. Everyone's arguing in Europe. Everyone's arguing in my country. Nothing's wrong with that. In fact, it's quite wonderful. They used to shoot people uh, that argued. Uh, and uh, I watched the demonstration today. Um, nobody was shot. It was very orderly. It was very nice. 
you just normal country. I don't know exactly what more Poland wants uh, of its uh, transition. You still are uh, a relatively poor country, but Poland's been the fastest growing country in Europe uh, over the past 25 years. That's not bad, I congratulate you. It doesn't get better than this, I'm sorry to tell you. That's just life. Uh, there's no, uh, it's true, of course, you had a saint uh, as Pope, so it may seem like miracles would be fair. Uh, and, uh, but, but I don't think you can expect miracles all the time. Uh, now you're in normal life. Uh, and uh, I was going to show you a couple of things. Maybe I'll just show you just a couple of things, because I think you, you really should know. Right, right here. This is, uh, this is uh, just a national income. I just want you to see some of the economic uh, realities of, of the country. So you can see from 1980 uh, through 1990, Poland was just kind of dead uh, in the water. It was, of course, in martial law. It was in chaos. It was bankrupt. And then the reform started. And uh, yeah, in measured data, that was one year. <laughs> and then uh, Poland uh, began the fastest growth in all of Europe. Thank you. That was one year. That's after 45 years of communism. That's not bad. You deserve congratulations, and you also deserve to smile a little bit uh, at uh, what happened. Don't be so grim. Next. So uh, somebody sent me today the data on our polls happy. Well, the actual fact is polls are happy. Uh, and they're a lot happier now than they were uh, 13 years ago. Uh, every two years, there's a sociological uh, survey done. Uh, and uh, in 2000, 64% said uh, uh, rather uh, very happy or rather happy. And by 2013, 80% said uh, very happy or rather happy. So uh, all your long faces, I don't believe you. Okay, next. So basically, Poland grew the fastest of all uh, of the countries uh, in the region and the fastest of all of the countries in Europe. I don't know how to do better than that. I don't even know how to advise you to do better than that. Uh, you should just be very proud of what's been accomplished. Not that you don't have problems. I've visited 131 countries in the world. They all have problems. Even Sweden has problems. Not so many, but it has some. Uh, and uh, Poland still has problems, but a lot less problems than it had uh, in 25 years ago. So you see, uh, if you go back, Poland is the top line, uh, and uh, the uh, Former Soviet countries are here, and the middle is uh, the European transition economies. These are all data from the International Monetary Fund. You can just pull them off the website. Next. And this is uh, just within Western Europe. Look at this. In 1989, Hungary was uh, 65% richer than Poland in per person terms. Look what happened in 2013. Poland overtook Hungary to have a higher per capita income. Congratulations. That's a remarkable thing. And by the way, nobody predicted it in 1989. Nobody. Next. This is, uh, okay, uh, similar. Next. Poland on top. Uh, this is uh, Poland compared to the Western European countries. So if you start uh, all of them with an index of one, in other words, here's the starting point. <laughs> Which country just edges out on top at the end? That would be Poland. You beat every country. Now, one was way ahead until it collapsed, which was Ireland. Uh, other than that, Poland just completely outpaced the pack. Next. 
This is Poland compared to uh, the United States income. So again, starting in 1950, Poland was at about one quarter of the U.S. per capita income. This is the communist period. Take it with a little bit of grain of salt, exactly the accuracy of these numbers. But the reported data rose till 1976. Uh, I came to Poland in that year to Wroclaw, actually uh, days after the railroad tracks were ripped up by the strikers. That was the beginning of a tremendous unrest. From 76 to 1989, there was a collapse of Poland. Uh, Poland went bankrupt. Poland couldn't pay its foreign debts. The whole Soviet system ground to a halt. And then at the end of the period, it was really, as I told you, just falling to pieces of an old and bad idea. And it finally died in 89 in Poland. Poland killed it. And the Soviet Union stopped twitching two years afterwards. Uh, and um, Poland reached its bottom. From that point on, Poland has reached the highest level relative to the United States of per capita income in its history. Uh, and now it's uh, about 40% of the US per capita income. Poland's never had a per capita income in all of its history that high. So this is, the, this, this is a, a great achievement of the country. Next. There's a lot of concern about the inequality in Poland. And so I clip the data from the OECD because the OECD measures comparable the uh, co Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient goes from zero to one. Zero is everybody is identical. One is that one person has all the income and everyone else has nothing. So you go from zero to one. A pretty high in Gini inequality is about 0.45 or so. That's my country, the United States. We have a very unequal distribution of income. And if you look at uh, in these countries of the OECD, take a country like Denmark. Those are my favorite countries, the social democracies. So that's a Gini of 0.248. Uh, take uh, a country. Uh, Chile is very high, 0.39. Uh, Israel, uh, 0.37. And then if you go to the next uh, graph, I couldn't put it all because there are too many OECD countries. Poland is at 0.30. Poland's just in the, in the middle of the pack. It's not extraordinarily high. It's kind of average. Uh, some are lower, many are higher. The United States is 0.378. It's one of the most unequal countries in the high income world. Poland's average, nothing special. I'm sorry? Oh. And, and the data show, at least if you go back uh, one, one slide, uh, so, okay, around 2000, mid 2000s, late 2000s, now go forward. So Poland went from 0.316 to 0.349 to 0.305. There's no trend of widening inequality. It's, according to these data, it's kind of moderate, nothing extraordinary, but it's there. Okay, next. Well, this is just recounting the, uh, the success in uh, one year of inflation, and then inflation got under control. Next. This is interesting. Poland managed its economy uh, without an increase of debt, whereas the other countries of Eastern Europe had soaring amounts of debt. That's partly because of the debt cancellation that Poland enjoyed in the early, uh, in 1991. Next. So how did Poland achieve such fast growth? Why did Poland achieve such rapid development? Because it became part of Europe. This is the essential fact to understand. That's why German companies came to invest a lot. 
remade many cities of Poland. It's why other European countries have, uh, or their companies have come. That's where a huge amount of the growth has come. Poland has had soaring inflow of investment. For example, Ukraine, nothing. You don't go to Ukraine. You stop at Poland. That's why Ukraine is partly in such deep crisis. No one would invest there. But Poland, as being part of the European Union, has been able to attract huge investment. I can tell you how it works. And I know it because I helped bring the very first investment into this country, which was an investment by Asea Brown Bovari, ABB, which invested in the turbine manufacturing in this country. In the summer of 1989, I got a call when I was working uh, for Solidarity already in the summer. I got a call from an official at ABB. They said, we want to discuss the Poland's reform with you. I said, okay, fine, I'm going to Poland. I, I'm going to transfer through the Frankfurt airport. Why don't we meet there? And so we met there, and this woman, who I came to know afterwards, very wonderful uh, woman, said, we're thinking about making an investment in Poland, but the board, our board, is against it. It's very dangerous. I said, no, Poland's going to have big reforms. It's safe. What do you mean, big reforms? I said, Poland is going to be a market economy. No. How are we ever going to get our money out? I said, Poland's going to have a convertible currency. What do you mean? Well, it's going to have a convertible currency. You just take your money out, convert Zwotis uh, back to uh, Deutschmarks. What, when? In five years? No, January. Now. Yeah, I said, I can't be sure, but that's what it should be. That's what I'm recommending. That's what I think is going to happen. So she said, can you come to the board I don't remember which, I think maybe Geneva. I don't remember where ABB is. But anyway, I went to their board. Uh, Percy Barnovic was the CEO, and they, it's a very, was, it was and is a very impressive company. And I went in the fall, and I talked about the Baltarovich plan, because by then there was a Baltarovich plan. And they ended up making the first investment. And they put money into a factory, and they made a lot of money, and they hired a lot of workers, and, and they turned a decrepit company into a modern technology of one of the best turbine manufacturers in the world. And that's also important to understand. Everything about Poland's economy in 1989 was, at best, second rate, because it was Soviet technology. This was the greatest stupidity and tragedy of the Soviet system which was that they made everything that the West made just crummy. But ingenious that they could do it, by the way. You know, really wonderful engineers, very clever, but not competitive. So the only place you could sell things was <laughs> to Russia, to Kazakhstan. Those were the only place to be a CMEA country a Comic-Con country. Otherwise, no one would buy this outside. It was the wrong technology. It didn't fit. They made airplanes. Most of the time they landed. Most of the time they took off. But they wouldn't be bought versus Airbus or Boeing. And so that was Poland's fate up until 1989. Then you take your turbine manufacturer and ABB comes in, and suddenly it's a world-class turbine that can be exported anywhere in the world. That's how you make economic development. You can't do it closed. You can't do it if in 10 years the currency is going to be convertible, not today. So soaring foreign investment. And then next, soaring exports. Soaring exports. Poland started to pay its own way in the world. It earned money. It sold things to world markets. Bravo. Poland became a sophisticated and is a sophisticated manufacturing country in Europe, part of global value chains. And this is what the curve looks like. Nothing for years and years and years. Start the reforms, and then things take off 
and it's the combination of foreign investment and, and the markets that made it possible. Next. Health conditions improved dramatically, much more than the rest of uh, the transition economies. Next. So unemployment rate. Poland is again in the middle on average according to the OECD data. Quite high youth unemployment, average overall employment. Next. So Poland is here in this uh, list. My advice to you on unemployment is study hard what Germany's doing. Because Germany is the only country that has really invented a solution for youth unemployment. And it involves institutions that help young people go from school to work in an effective way. That's an institutional design. Study your next door neighbor. They're the most successful country in the world in employing young people. And they're right next door. I can't make Americans look at Germany, but you can go look at Germany. Go study it. Figure out how to apply lessons in Poland. That would be a very big help. Next. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So, smile. Relax a little bit. It's a success I haven't seen anywhere else. Period. So you should enjoy that. But don't stop there. It's your turn. Make reforms. Make things better. But most importantly, one thing I do want to advise you that is really really important for you to understand right now. Poland has to be competitive internationally. Poland has to earn its way in international markets. In 1989, you could beg for mercy, or better yet, I could beg for mercy for you. And I did. And I was proud to do it and pleased to do it. Now, no one cares what happens to Poland. Okay? except Poland. So you're now on your own, truly. There's no heroism. You're normal. You're competing. And the one thing that you have to do is be competitive internationally because there's no remorse for countries that cannot compete. And so don't lose that. And I can tell you, because I've spent 30 years studying the countries I really like, I like this one a lot, but I've spent 30 years studying Sweden, for example. Sweden has a good social welfare system, but it is relentlessly competitive in the export sector. It's no joke. It's hold wages down, it's shift employment, it is not protecting work, it's making competitive industry because Sweden knows no one cares. All the social welfare in the world will not buy the bread. You have to be competitive to do that. And so whatever else you do, make sure you can compete. And now no one's going to come to your rescue. So that's, that's my real advice for you in this generation. Make things better but don't lose the focus because we live in a world market economy. And so you have to pay attention to that for sure. Teraz nawet ja się boję, że państwo się nie śmiejecie, w ogóle nie, nie uśmiechacie. I, I only said that even I am afraid that they are not smiling. Okay. Um, um, no dobrze, właściwie wypada mi zapytać tylko o drugi plan Zaksa, jak stać się Szwecją. Um, jeśli oczywiście jeszcze nią nie jesteśmy. Have you become Sweden? If we are not. Oh. So please, what yeah. would you suggest us to? I mean, then I'm gonna have maybe one or two more detailed questions, and um, and then we can uh, maybe give the floor to the audience. I don't, have a, uh, I don't have a plan for Poland right now uh, because, uh, unfortunately, there's no shortages outside. 
The currency is stable. Uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, there's, uh, there's no crisis. Uh, but seriously, what, what you do need to do uh, is uh, to continue to develop uh, good talent and uh, continue with hard work. Poland has made its way quite uh, far. Uh, it's outperformed uh, everybody else. But you can't, uh, unfortunately, uh, kind of rest in this world uh, because uh, the world is constantly changing and constantly uh, difficult. Your neighborhood is still very difficult, obviously, and dangerous. Thank goodness uh, Poland is part of NATO. Uh, I don't think Putin is, uh, I'm sure he's not uh, going to uh, meddle with that. Uh, though he's ready to uh, do a lot of damage to your next door neighbor. So you have to be very uh, alert and uh, very careful. The world situation is getting more complicated, not simpler than it was before. Um, one of the things I'm working a lot on these days, pretty much uh, around the clock, is uh, an issue which Poland really doesn't want to hear about. Uh, which is climate change, uh, because uh, the world has become even more complicated. You can't just focus on economy. We have to focus on economy and environment together. And Poland's a major coal-producing country. Coal is a lousy resource, unfortunately. Uh, and so this is a mess. And one of the answers in Poland has been to be among the denying countries or countries that don't want to hear about this issue. That's a problem because uh, this is a real issue and there are going to have to be real solutions to it. I think for every country, the quality of education and skills is really essential. The United States is falling very badly on this as an example. Our education system is for the average student is very bad now. For the wealthy child is quite good. Uh, but for the average is rather bad. And for the poor child is rather hopeless. Um, and the trick of all societies uh, is to make sure that every child gets a good education, no matter what their family background. I would say that that's a defining measure of the quality of a society's values as well as a trick to its competitiveness. If you look at what these social democracies do best, the thing they do best is take care of children. That's actually the strongest point of social democracies is that a poor child has a normal chance in life. And so that's where I would also urge you to pay to to pay attention uh, because uh, you have a lot of uh, poor kids in this country. Uh, I don't think the education system is what it needs to be on average. And uh, given all of these issues about competition, that's where I would uh, pay, pay some attention. I can tell you, by the way, I spend a lot of time in Asia, uh, a lot of time in Korea, for example. God, do they work hard, by the way. Unbelievable. And the students work hard. And the schooling is competitive. I think maybe too much so, I'm sorry to say. But in any event, those are your competition. They came out of even much worse poverty than Poland. Now they're quite a bit richer than Poland. Uh, and uh, it's because of this relentless education system that Samsung, for example, is the world leader in information technology, especially in mobile. And that came through this kind of relentless uh, commitment to competition, uh, to international competitiveness, I should say. So I think there's a, a lot to do right now. It's not simple. Uh, nothing is, uh, is, is simple. Um, don't uh, slow down in, in what you're doing, but Definitely the challenges today are quite different from the challenges of 1989, completely different.
Jedna ze statystyk, która się nie pojawiła w tej prezentacji, a dotyczy dość poważnego problemu w Polsce i rosnącego problemu właściwie wszędzie na świecie, to jest to zjawisko pool jobs, czyli, czyli właściwie umów czasowych, umów śmieciowych, coraz bardziej skomplikowana i, i skomplikowana kwestia i rosnący problem w Europie. W Polsce to jest aż 25% umów, a średnia w Unii Europejskiej to jest 10% i co ciekawe w tych najbardziej liberalnych krajach, w Stanach Zjednoczonych, Wielkiej Brytanii zaledwie 5%. Chciałem poprosić o komentarz, to znaczy dlaczego tak jest i co z tym zrobić. You know, uh, nobody knows uh, really the answer to what's happening in labor markets very clearly right now, but I have a general feeling that uh, many people share that uh, low-skilled work is really being uh, very seriously disadvantaged by technological advances. And the idea that as we move to robotics, for example, and as we move to higher technology information systems, that people with low skills or with very routine work are the ones that lose with such change. I think that's probably true. Uh, and it's probably a major change that's taking place around the world right now. Uh, there are two big changes that took place in the labor market. One is that work became global, and on the whole, Poland was a beneficiary of that because work that used to be done in Germany was then done in Poland. And that's where a lot of your income rise came from, that you were able to uh, be the lower cost production for Volkswagen for many, many important components, for example. That happened on a global scale. Most of American, man not most, but millions of American manufacturing jobs ended up in China. I think you're, on the whole, Poland was benefited because Instead of German jobs going to China, German jobs went to Poland. Uh, and Poland became a, a big beneficiary of that for a while because there are countries behind you that are trying to take away Poland's jobs for sure. Uh, Vietnam or Cambodia or African countries, uh, they want to outcompete you. So this is uh, part of globalization. The second thing that's happening is that information technology is our biggest revolution. We are in the middle, of course, of a revolution. And I think it's changing a lot. I know that, you know, of course, that certain industries that used to employ massively don't employ people anymore. They just employ machines. Uh, auto plants might have a few workers in them that used to have thousands uh, because the robots are able to do this. But it's not just robots now, it's artificial intelligent systems. Uh, and this is coming very fast. I have a prediction that in 10 years there won't be any workers in Starbucks because you'll go in, your eye will be scanned automatically, that will go straight to your uh, PayPal account. Uh, probably just your iris scan will tell the computer that you want a uh, vente mocha latte uh, and uh, it won't even have to ask you, but uh, if you do uh, want something different, you'll say it, and of course voice recognition uh, will immediately pick it up, and the machine will make it, and you'll just pick it up at the end of the line. And who needs cash anyway? That's an old-fashioned uh, idea. So I think most jobs like that won't exist. We're going to have to figure out how to make society work in principle, it doesn't sound bad. I think we can just go sit at the beach uh, and uh, let the machines do everything. That would be the ultimate evolution uh, of society. But in the meantime, people will lose their jobs and uh, 
lower skilled workers will tend to lose uh, more jobs. Uh, and, uh, or if they keep their jobs, they'll keep them at very low pay. And so this, everything I've just said is hypothetical because nobody really knows among the quote experts, there are no experts of what's really happening in the labor market. This is all highly debated, but this is my interpretation. Tym niemniej e, m, zjawisko e, pull jobs to jest właściwie część szerszego zjawiska rosnących nierówności na świecie i tego, co właściwie do znudzenia już e, się e, powtarza i wciąż nie ma na to lekarstwa. Teraz ostatnio taką nadzieję rozbudziła książka Tomasa Piketty'ego, którą będziemy mieli e, możliwość wydać w naszym wydawnictwie tutaj. Ale i właściwie chciałem zapytać Pana o komentarz, to znaczy myślę, że dotarła do Państwa wszystkich taka podstawowa diagnoza Piketty'ego i także, także recepta, czyli to przekonanie, że właściwie ten dowód statystyczny, historyczno-statystyczny, że podstawą, fundamentem nierówności jest, jest nierówność bogactwa w mniejszym, w większym stopniu niż nierówność dochodów, i jako jedna z odpowiedzi na to e, obłożenie tych, e, tego bogactwa dochodami. Jak, jak, jak się Pan odnosi do tego i na ile Pan uważa za realistyczne wprowadzenie takiego opodatkowania? Well, I, I actually wrote that and called for it in the United States a year ago. Uh, in a book called The Price of Civilization. So I think it's a, a, a very fine idea. Um, and basically, uh, of course, you know, the details matter, but there is a rising inequality. But that's why we have a mixed economy, because there are market forces and then there are political forces that help with redistribution, that help to protect poor people, uh, that help to provide skills. And that's, again, why I would look at the social democracies. You're very close by. They are not suffering this massive crisis uh, because they have taken care that the market forces should be there. But in addition, they want to make sure that children don't grow up in poverty. They want to make sure that, uh, that uh, schools are good, that skills are good. Um, and basically, They're both against poverty at the bottom and they're against uh, great wealth uh, of the uh, entrepreneurs, for example. And so they aim for moderation. I think it's a good philosophy uh, and I think it works. So one of the things that makes me optimistic is that we don't have to dream of utopia. You can see working economies right before your eyes. And Poland is in a good position because it's right in a neighborhood of very successful countries. I'd look west and north, by the way, not south and east. Uh, but uh, if you do look uh, west and north, uh, Germany is definitely a successful economy. Uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, these are not countries that are overwhelmed by inequality and by breakdown. They're actually quite competitive, uh, high incomes, great prosperity, high employment, uh, budget under control. Uh, but they live uh, moderately. Uh, they're not aiming to create billionaire after billionaire. They're aiming to live uh, in, a, uh, in an environment of high equity, uh, but very hard work. They also like leisure, by the way, also. So it's a good balance. To, these are good balanced societies. And they're also quite happy societies. I'm happy that Poland is a happy society, too. Uh, but when we did a study uh, last year, Denmark was the happiest society in the world. So I would uh, try to find out what's uh, in, their, in, in their solution as well. I just wouldn't take this as some kind of catastrophe. I think basically uh, if you let inequality dominate the political systems like the United States has done, then you end up amplifying the market inequalities. If instead you give the preference to democracy, uh, then you control the inequalities. And so part of the solution is don't let your politics become corrupted and don't let big money 
be the main driver of, of uh, politics. In the United States, money drives politics, and then politics favors high income. And so we're in a vicious circle right now, and you definitely don't want that. Nie zdążymy już tego dokładnie omówić, ale ostatnią właśnie dekadę, jeśli nie więcej, spędził Pan na próbie rozwiązania problemu biedy na świecie, głównie w Afryce. I chciałem Pana zapytać właściwie słowem dla, 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 dla Państwa, którzy nie wiecie, ale myślę, że wiecie, bo te książki są wydane i też szeroko komentowane, recenzowane w polskich mediach. To był, to był właśnie pomysł na to, żeby namówić bogaty Zachód na to, żeby pieniądze, które przeznacza na armię, na rozmaite takie wydatki, które być może nie wydają się tak palące jak, jak śmierć głodowa w innej części świata, żeby przeznaczyć je na pomoc, która w ciągu Wcale nie aż tak kluczowa, bo Pan obliczył, że to byłaby raptem jedna czwarta budżetu Stanów Zjednoczonych wydatkowanego na armię, żeby, przezna żeby w ciągu właściwie 20 lat w jednego pokolenia zlikwidować e, e, biedę na świecie. Jak Pan ocenia te swoje starania? Na ile to się udało, na ile nie i właściwie dlaczego nie? Które argumenty? Pan używa argumentów ekonomicznych, e, jak rozumiem, dlatego że etyczne dotąd nie działały. To znaczy pan też mówi, jakie są korzyści dla Zachodu z tego. Przede wszystkim korzyści obniżenia ryzyka geopolitycznego, mniej wojen, mniej imigrantów, czy mniej takich niekontrolowanych sytuacji na świecie. Dlaczego, co się udało i, 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 i jeśli nie, to dlaczego nie? Well. First, I like ethical arguments because uh, I think they're the most uh, important arguments and they're the most powerful arguments, actually. Um, one of the things that uh, we achieved in the last uh, 15 years was the cancellation of a lot of debt of poor countries, which was uh, like the argument I made for Poland's debt cancellation. And the biggest uh, advocate uh, and supporter of that was Pope John Paul II. Uh, when uh, I, I went to meet with him in 1999, just before the Jubilee year, and he made a, uh, and the Roman Catholic Church made a very powerful statement about uh, global justice requiring the debts of poor countries to be canceled. It actually had a very big effect. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of Catholic congressmen in the United States They listened to what the Pope says, and there were a lot of uh, others uh, that, that did so also. And uh, actually, the religious community convinced uh, George W. Bush, who wasn't too interested in these things, uh, to uh, donate a lot of uh, U.S. money to fight AIDS and uh, to control other diseases in Africa. And so I'm, I actually believe that the moral arguments are the most powerful arguments we have. Now, The truth is we don't spend very much for poor people in general. Interestingly, if you line up countries like I've been discussing and ask how much do countries pay for their own poor people, Sweden's number one, Denmark, okay, all those countries, and then line them up and ask how much do they pay for poor people in other countries, it's the same ranking. So in the United States, we don't pay for poor people in the U.S., we don't pay for poor people abroad, uh, whereas the social democracies pay for poor people in their own country, and they pay a lot for poor people abroad. So it's something about values, not about trade-offs. And I happen to think that this is the way to a safer world and a better world. And so I think we should do this. Now, you know, I'm only... Uh, asking for less than 1% of the income of the rich countries. So it's not a big ask. It turns out you can spend a whole lifetime asking for it, and you don't necessarily get very far, because by the time people are rich, they're pretty greedy. Uh, and uh, they feel that the most important thing is uh, that someone may be catching up with them behind so that they have to keep all their money. So trying to get money out of the U.S. Uh, is not a simple matter, but it's actually an important one. The basic story is that every time 
we've been able to mobilize funds, there's been big improvements. So the proudest things that I'm most happy about are that AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria have come down sharply in Africa in the last 13 years because we were able to raise funds to make a big difference. And my wife and I work on public health in Africa. There's been a huge, huge improvement of public health. That's the starting point for development because if you're healthy, you can grow up and go to school, learn something, and uh, be more productive in the future. So health is really a great starting point. So I'm optimistic, and I'll tell you the interesting thing is that when I began, uh, the and when the Millennium Development Goals began 14 years ago as the goals to fight poverty, Africa was like Poland in 1989. It was completely in crisis. Now it's the second fastest growing region of the whole world economy. Asia is number one, Sub-Saharan Africa is number two, but from a very low base. But it's starting that recovery now. Or not recovery, because it's never been rich. It's starting the economic development. I'm hoping that it will last. I'm worried about two big things, though. One is climate change, because climate change would destroy Africa, because it's already hot enough. It's already dry enough. It's got big problems. The second is too many children. The families are too big. The population's growing too fast. And you can't keep up with it. Uh, Africa has already had a five-time increase of population since 1950, five times. And the projection is another four times during this century. That would be a 20-time increase. I don't know how to, I don't know how that can be compatible with development. So I'm hoping that fertility rates will come down and that stabilization of population would be a big boost for further development. Jedno pytanie, już chciałem Państwu oddać głos, ale jedno pytanie muszę jednak zadać. Czy w rozmowie z Janem Pawłem II nie próbował go Pan przekonać do wdrożenia programu antykoncepcji, do zgody na ten etyczny argument w Afryce? Co byłoby jakimś, co byłoby z pewnością zaradzeniem na problem zarówno HIV i AIDS, jak i też rosnącej błyskawicznie populacji? I gave a lecture at the Vatican last year, and I had one slide in about 40 slides that just showed Africa's rapid population. I didn't even dare to say anything more. I just said the population's growing too fast. That's all I said. And so I got to the end of the talk, and uh, there was a commentator. He was the editor of the Vatican newspaper. So I had spoken for one hour and 30 seconds of that hour was about population. And the rest was about fighting poverty and many things. And at the end, the first words he said was, we disagree completely with Professor Sachs uh, about population. And uh, so I was quite taken aback because I had only said a tiny little bit. Then I was called to see a senior Vatican official, not the Pope, but to uh, see a senior Vatican official. And a cardinal let me out of, led me out of the room. And the cardinal leaned over to me and said, Mr. Sachs, don't listen to him. We agree with what you said. Uh, so I don't know what the view is, actually. Uh, I think the view is probably a view that's debated inside the Vatican. Uh, and I do think that it would be a good idea to think through uh, these ideas uh, clearly, because I think they make a big difference for the quality of life of people. No, dobrze. Mamy czas na kilka pytań w takim razie. Tu jest jedna pani. No, najpierw była pani. Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor, for, for sharing your views with us. I have two questions uh, back to Poland, if I may. Uh, connected to Polish membership in the EU. Um, number one is, um, there's a debate in Poland about Polish membership in the Eurozone. Uh, some say we should join as soon as possible, others say we should uh, postpone it. So what would be your view? When, when is the right moment for us to, to join? 
And number, number two is, um, well, it's undoubtedly uh, a fact that uh, Polish growth has been, um, well, we can, we can connect it to uh, the EU funds that we get from the EU. But as we know, uh, the next budget, 2020, 2027, will not be so generous to us. So is there a threat that, uh, am I right to assume that there's a threat that our growth will slow down without this money? And if that's the case, what can we do to prevent this situation? Thanks. If I were uh, you, uh, I would not join the euro right now because uh, I would uh, wait to find out what happens to the euro. Uh, the euro's been obviously a big mess for the last five years, almost a calamity. So I don't think that joining the euro really makes sense under these circumstances. I would let it go a little bit further, uh, make sure that uh, Germany plays the role it should to help Greece and others get out of the mess before joining this mess. Uh, hopefully, uh, stronger institutions in Europe will make the euro work better, but right now I don't think that they work very well. And since you don't have to join, I wouldn't join. Uh, at, some point. at some point, yes, but not now, I mean. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hurry the situation. And on, on the second question, um, basically, uh, Poland will need to uh, be su more successful exporting uh, because the foreign exchange that you earn now by transfers won't come by transfers. Uh, and so uh, they're going to have to come by earnings. Uh, and I think that uh, you're probably right uh, that Europe isn't going to be as generous going forward uh, as it's been uh, in, in the past. Uh, and so. Uh, finding a way to do this without uh, much European aid, I think, is pretty important, actually. Uh, Professor Sachs, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I wanted uh, to ask you about one structural measure, because you've mentioned Germany as being a successful economy in implying structural measures in terms of improving the situation of young, educated people on, on the work market. If you could name one, just a one single step that is uh, perhaps for the best in terms of regulating the precariousness and regulating precariousness and the bad situation for the young people who are struggling with unemployment, who uh, cannot enter the proper job market before yeah. the age of 30. Yeah, the, the main thing Germany does is apprenticeship programs. This is the the beauty of it, which is they create a structure where you have a structured transition from school to work. Uh, and the state pays for companies to hire young people. And then the skills are learned on the job to an important extent. So the skills that are learned are not what the school thinks uh, the skills should be, but what the company needs the skills to be for effective employment. This is a great idea. Uh, it's basic. It, it seems so simple. Uh, but almost no country does it. Of course, it goes back in Germany 125 years of tradition, so it's not simple to set up. But I think that it is a very right thing that, you know, when government trains people, that's probably the worst uh, because the government knows least about what the labor market wants. Uh, Schooling is one thing. That's formal education, general knowledge, uh, capacity to think, to reason, to write. Uh, that's all fine. But the skills for jobs are quite different. And uh, this idea of apprenticeship, which of course is <laughs> 500 years old, uh, doesn't exist in most market uh, economies. And so it goes under the label of active labor market policy. The United States has almost none of it. Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, quite a lot of it. And I would uh, look at those institutions carefully and see how they would best fit into the Polish situation. Dla równowagi językowej zapytam po polsku. 
Z tego, co Pan dotychczas powiedział i pokazał na slajdach, wynika, że wraz z Balcerowiczem nie macie żadnych wyrzutów sumienia i nie czujecie się odpowiedzialni za bardzo wysokie koszty społeczne polskiej transformacji. No, wymienię tylko katastrofalne bezrobocie, zubożenie, bankructwa, samobójstwa. Czy rzeczywiście trzeba było wszystko zniszczyć do cna i na gołej ziemi budować nowe? No, wiem, że takim zwolennikiem takiej, takiego postępowania był między innymi również Bronisław Geremek. To jest, zresztą Pana te slajdy, statystyki no, nie są w pełni obiektywne, bo sięgają tylko do 2005 roku. Gdybyśmy je przesunęli o 10 lat do przodu, to nie wiadomo, jak by one wyglądały. I druga kwestia, czy nie sądzi Pan, że od właściwie lat 70. XX wieku, gdy pieniądz światowy przestał mieć pokrycie w złocie i produkcji materialnej. Cała światowa ekonomika no, jest tworzona właśnie dzięki pieniądzowi wirtualnemu, który kreuje na siłę do dzisiaj międzynarodowa finansjera i z tego wydaje mi się też powodu światowa ekonomika wstrząsana wieloma kryzysami no, stacza się po równie pochyłe. Tu mówiliśmy o wielu konsekwencjach tego. No właśnie przede wszystkim rozwarstwienie dochodowe, rozwarstwienie bogactwa to już doszło do takiego poziomu, że to no, grozi wybuchem na skalę niemal światową. Chciałem, żeby się Pan do tych dwóch kwestii ustosunkował. Well, I'm uh, no fan of uh, international finance uh, the way that it is right now and uh, believe that it needs regulation and agree that Wall Street almost ruined the world economy uh, in 2008. Um, so uh, I uh, don't share every word you said, but I certainly uh, agree that uh, finance can be very destructive if not managed, and that's why Poland and every country should have a, a regulated financial structure, not an unregulated uh, financial system. Uh, and this is what I uh, advocate uh, for the United States and advocate uh, for the world also is uh, uh, proper regulation of, uh, of the financial system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sack. Um, what has been uh, very interesting, the fact you now recognize we are a normal economy. So if we talk in terms of a normal economy, uh, then there's two things that have been very popularly pushed on the supply side of the economy, namely deregulation and privatization. In your initial address, for example, you said that health should not be privatized. Effectively, in Poland, that is what they're doing. You also mentioned that in the case of Germany, their apprenticeship system. In fact, when we look at the labor market, we actually see that in Germany it's a very regulated uh, market. You cannot be a carpenter unless you have the appropriate certificate and training. And therefore, aren't you saying, in fact, that a, a lot of the modern prescriptions for the normal economy are, in fact, totally wrong for our long-term health? Yeah, I, a market economy is not an unregulated market economy. Uh, and a market economy is not a free market economy. Uh, successful economies are mixed economies. That means they have both market and state. It means they have market and regulation. And it's the political debate about where those lines are drawn most appropriately. In my own view, as I've explained, I am left of center. I'm a social democrat in my prescriptions and my advice. And that means that I would recommend uh, a, a Danish or Dutch uh, or Swedish approach more than a UK or US approach. These are your debates. They're very valid debates. Uh, Poland has also lots of good models to look at and good comparisons to make. I've always found it odd 
that uh, I'm not going to go back to this, but I have found it odd that 1989 was somehow understood as being about that debate, because to my mind it wasn't about that debate at all. It was about the debate of making a market uh, and uh, stabilizing a breakdown and getting some help for this country and, and uh, getting started. It wasn't about the long-term future of Poland, at least not from my point of view. I was only here to help for two years. Uh, and the long-term future is for you to make in your politics year in, year out. Nothing was settled then. Um, and again, my own taste is uh, a place that uh, taxes 40 to 50 percent of its national income and then uses that effectively for education, for social support, for job skills, for environmental protection, uh, and so forth. So that's a mixed economy. And I believe that those, that kind of economy can be fair, environmentally sustainable, socially inclusive, and highly productive. It's not an escape for work, by the way. There, I don't, that I haven't found uh, how one does that. This is a tough world. People have to work hard, unfortunately, uh, to uh, make it. Uh, in, in the world, but it is a way to make a, a more balanced and fair society. So I'm against privatization of uh, the health system, for example. I don't know what's happening in Poland. I haven't paid attention. But I do know what's happening in the United States. And we have the most private of health systems, and we end up with the most expensive and least fair of health systems. And it's not a coincidence. Uh, it's related to the privatization itself because privatization both caters to those who have more money, and I don't think that's fair with health, and it also uh, allows for market abuse of power uh, because health is not a commodity. And so if you tell hospitals you're private, in the United States context, what happens is these hospitals become local monopolies they charge outlandish salaries, uh, for, or they charge outlandish prices, uh, and the heads of these hospitals make unbelievable salaries, many millions of dollars a year, and the health care is far too expensive. So again, I would be very careful. My general advice is study what others are doing. Benchmark, compare, don't go to theory. Again, it may surprise you, uh, because I know sometimes these ideas get very confused, but my ideas were not about theory. My ideas were about normal. Uh, so I was looking to next door for you, uh, and that I still believe is the right place for, for Poland is, uh, as part of uh, Europe and, and fully part of Europe. But you have many choices within Europe, and you can invent some on your own. Don't invent too many. Uh, be careful. Uh, but uh, you can invent a little bit, uh, but benchmark carefully uh, because that's the best way to look. And if someone says health care should be private, say, well, how is it done in this place, this place, this place? What's the evidence? How would you rank these different systems? How does Poland uh, relate to these? This is the most important thing. We don't do this in the United States. In the U.S., we think we don't have to look at anyone else. Uh, but in Poland, you have all your... 26 other, 27 other states uh, in the European Union. Uh, so you can do careful benchmarking. And the OECD does it for you also. Uh, so that gives you some ability to make some decisions on, on these alternatives. But basically, universal experience of successful countries is mixed economies, a lot of regulation, a lot of public spending. Just do it well. Can I have one question? Uh, maybe interesting. What's your attitude to contemporary ideas of Leszek Balcerowicz, who would say exactly the same as you, but with the minus? So, like, no regulation, no public spending. There is one universal natural science called economy. So we don't need to follow any experiences of other economies. Predominantly, we shouldn't be blind regarding social democracies. And uh, this is the, the way how we should uh, develop our own economy. The rest is 
sometimes Leszek Balczyk would call it even fascism, as he did uh, in the in this large collection of of, of essays. Um, um, what's your I mean, what's your uh, attitude to his contemporary pro ideas? So let let me first uh, say that. I really haven't uh, had the occasion to talk to Lezhek in detail for many years. So I'm not really current with his discussions and I can't really comment in detail. I knew Lezhek uh, well from 1989 into the early 1990s and uh, I admired him a lot uh, for his uh, honesty, his integrity, uh, his uh, boldness, which I thought was needed for all the reasons we've discussed. I know that he is much more free market than I am. Uh, at the time, it didn't really matter. That's what I keep trying to explain. At the time, it wasn't the, the, the beginning. Uh, it it was, wasn't even the point. It, it, uh, it was, we're all going that way. <laughs> but. I know we don't share views, but I can't really answer your question fairly to him because I don't know his views in detail now. Um, and we haven't had long discussions, so I don't want to be unfair to him. I can only express my own views, uh, as I've been trying to do. And if, if he's very free market, I'm not that way. Uh, but I can't really tell you because uh, I just don't know the detail. Okay. So let's have a last question. Uh, dwa pod warunkiem, że będzie to jeden pan i jedna pani. No, ale mieliśmy, wydaje mi się, że pani była pierwsza, czy się mylę? Tak? Dobrze, to, to zróbmy to jednak... E, przy, przepraszam, przepraszam, ale e, pani podnosiła do rękę od początku debaty. E, tak, pan, pan najpierw. Okay, so uh, the, the problem of unemployment and low wages is in Poland not only related to a problem of the um, poorly skilled people, but increasingly also of uh, college graduates, which is perhaps not surprising given that Poland is among those countries in the world which has, have the highest higher education enrollment rates, over 40%. And some people say that actually our economy isn't creating enough jobs requiring hiring education. So maybe we should actually aim at reducing this uh, higher education enrollment rate because it only creates expectations that will bounce to be let down. Uh, and maybe it's not the most efficient use of, uh, of public funds. But others say that if you ha are a country with high educational aspirations, it's a great thing and you should never try to arrest that. Uh, and also they say that um, we should not be looking at the economy as it is right now, which perhaps really isn't creating enough high-skilled jobs, but at the economy that we'll have in 10 years. So maybe this is an investment that will work out in the long run. What is your opinion and the, about this choice? In general, I'm uh, in principle more sympathetic with the second argument. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the 21st century requires a lot of skills. Of course, I would uh, like to know more than I do about what is being learned in higher education. Uh, are these good skills? Are they the right kinds of skills? Is it theoretical knowledge not so useful? By the way, nothing's wrong with theoretical knowledge, but maybe it's not exactly uh, translating. Again, take a look at Korea because very interesting case. Korea has just as a society gone into the most unbelievable education overdrive for 50 years, raising the proportions uh, of college going like almost no place in the world. And the result has been astoundingly successful. Uh, they have become uh, one of the wealthiest countries in the world from one of the poorest. Uh, with mastery of many high technology sectors. Now, uh, they're training a lot of engineers, for example. So there's a, a tremendous focus on technical education. I don't know if that's Poland's focus or not, whether that, and maybe that's part of the, the question. What's being learned? How is it being learned? Um, so that's, that's one thing I would try to take a look at, which I haven't done. 
Um, a second question I would have is about entrepreneurship. Uh, basically, are well-educated young people starting small companies? Does the society facilitate that? Do the universities facilitate that? Uh, do the universities create clusters of startup companies around? Is there more that can be done? You know, the Silicon Valley idea. Uh, this is not bad, actually. Uh, university business uh, clusters really do make some sense, and there's good experience with them. Uh, I don't know what's happening in Poland in that regard, but that requires some institutional design as well. Uh, maybe it would be good to look at what kinds of graduates are getting what kinds of jobs. In the United States, for example, if you know how to write software code and you're unemployed, you're really doing something wrong. It's almost impossible to find a good programmer. And if you do find a good programmer, you have to pay a fortune. Uh, and you have to uh, keep paying higher and higher money to keep them employed and to keep them from leaving. So you just feel the market demand for programming skills. I don't know if that's the sense here, but I bet it is uh, because this is a global market basically and it wouldn't be hard for Polish young programmers to be selling their skills anywhere in the world. But is there good training taking place in that? Is that where graduates are going? Poland has, you know, a cent centuries of tradition of mathematical expertise and leadership. Uh, and so it would be great to go back to uh, those traditions uh, of technical excellence. I'm sure that that plays a role. I'm almost sure that the best answer is strong education in the right areas and the worst answer is stop the high education uh, because uh, I don't see a future without skills. Okay, so um, I lied. It's not going to be the last question. <laughs> last question we will get from internet. We collected some questions by Twitter, if I understand. So, let's have it. Uh, okay, my question is about how do you build solidarity and social cohesion in a market economy where everybody's um, competing against each other and uh, afraid of losing their job and not everybody can be a programmer? How do you ensure that society values work such as nursing, healthcare, uh, the teachers? Because for the moment I feel that um, in Poland this is not happening. and. Uh, instead of being proud of having growth, everybody's just um, angry at people that they think got more out of it than themselves. And it is not fairly distributed either. So how do we build um, some kind of solidarity that also people working in public, uh, in the public sphere, um, get yeah. paid? I think this is, uh, this is related to the things we've been talking about uh, all evening. One example that I think is notable is education. Now, I don't know what's happening in Poland's education, but I'll just make a compare. I'll talk about the U.S. and Finland. Uh, in the U.S., education has become more and more privatized, and uh, the wealthy people who wanted to quote reform education have tried to make more and more of a business out of secondary education uh, and also attacked teachers actually and attacked teachers unions as the big obstacle to effective education. If you look at a different country, one of your neighbors, Finland, Finland has been one of the best performing countries on the international standards of education, what's called the PISA scores. And Finland's been at or near the top. But they have very strong teachers unions and they have only public education. So something doesn't fit with the privatization idea. What's the big difference? Actually in Finland there are two key ideas to their education system that I think are both compelling. One is that teachers are the most important people in society. So they pay teachers a lot, they honor teachers, 
They say that, and the best young people in Finland go to become teachers because it's a very esteemed profession. That's one thing. Second is the idea of equality. They stress social equality in the classroom and in the milieu of the public sector, that everybody should have a quality education. So I believe in those things compared to the American model a lot. That if you want excellence in education, you want excellent teachers, the society should praise the teachers. I'm a teacher, so I love societies that praise teachers. The societies that hold the teachers in highest esteem, by the way, are the Confucian societies. If you are a teacher in Japan, China, Korea, or if you're a professor of a Chinese, Japanese, or Korean student, you've got it made. They love their teachers, and I love that fact. Uh, because they say that the teacher is the great, this is what Confucius said, that this is the, the crucial role for society. So in truth, I think values matter a lot in how the society performs. Of course, you want excellence. You want to instill in children even some competitive spirit, of course. You want to instill an idea of excellence in education. But you also want to instill an idea of social inclusion, social equality, and you want to honor teachers, definitely. Uh, and uh, no government or society that attacks its teachers is going to be a healthy society. The United States is actually attacking its teachers. It's attacking its teachers' unions. It's saying the teachers are the obstacle. Well, that's just making education crumble. It's, not, it's lowering morale. It's lowering quality. It's making people reluctant to go into teaching. So I think that these are hints of uh, what, what needs to be done. So we are getting technologically higher. OK. Um, yeah, as Slavik said, we were receiving plenty of questions via Twitter and uh, from people watching the debate on the stream. And I'll let myself just ask one of those questions. And it's about so-called social capital. And if you see the correlation between how much and how many people engage in democratic mechanisms, as an example, voting, which is always a problem in Poland, and how stable the economy is, and how far can you push the reforms in such a country where people doesn't actually participate. I'm and that big, comes from yeah. Mikhail Ludwinski. Great. I, I'm a, a big believer in social capital and in moral capital as being very important for society. Uh, of course, I was a colleague of uh, Robert Putnam, who was the sociologist who has uh, probably done the most in the United States to uh, make known the concept of social capital. It's been found over and over again that in societies where there's high level of trust, where there is uh, honesty, uh, where there is uh, uh, a belief that government operates uh, without corruption, those societies perform better uh, than, in many ways, happier, more productive, uh, more economic development than societies in which trust is very low. If you look at the U.S. pattern, the trust has been going down for 40 years uh, because every couple of years we, the surveys uh, ask people, do, can you trust in general people in the rest of society? And the level of distrust has been rising. You really feel it in American society. Uh, you a and if you ask people, do you trust the government, then the answer is almost no, <laughs> uniform. That's the only thing on which Americans have an agreement, which is that Congress is mi our Congress is miserable. Um, so I believe that this kind of social capital is important, which is why, uh, again, I come back to the idea that a social democratic approach is probably the right balance uh, of, uh, of society. Um, I do need to stress, though, again and again, that even in the social democracies, 
where you have the ethos of equality, you have the ethos of inclusion, you have the ethos of no child in poverty, you also have the ethos of competitiveness. It's got to be there and it should not be misunderstood uh, because you still have to make your way in the world. Uh, and the society can be uh, with a lot of integrity, trust, uh, inclusion, but it still needs to be able to sell goods in the markets. Uh, it still needs good enterprise. It still needs good skills. It still needs good technology. There's no, no shortcut to that that I know of. It's just that if you have the rest, it's a more pleasant place to live. Uh, it's a higher quality of life, and it's more productivity for more of society. So the best part of social capital is that everybody gets to participate. You don't leave a large part of society behind. And when you, if you do, countries don't function very well when part of society is suffering very badly. Um, and so uh, this is really why it is also a very practical, not just a moral thing to do, but a very practical thing to do to make sure that there is an inclusive approach to the economy. I hope that we proved our competitiveness by having Professor Zaks here. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. I wish you good evening. Uh, K A. A S I A. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I have to tell you, uh, we got together uh, with some people from from the course, and we we're creating a website together. Great. Dedicated to sustainable development. So. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's fantastic. And uh, stay in touch. Here's my email address. Yeah, would you do that? Let me know. I would. Uh, that's fantastic. Good. Thank, thanks a lot. Of course. Of course. Great. What's your name? Okay. You have to spell it for me. Yeah, it's just regular. Okay. L-A-U-R-A. Yes. Thank you. It has been really, really nice. Oh, Thank great. You.